everyone. I'm Virginie Simonou-Gilbert. I'm a DPhil candidate in philosophy at the University of Oxford, and I'm pleased to chair this panel and Canadian launch event um, um, dedicated to the book The Edge of Sentience um, by Jonathan Birch, which was published earlier this year by the Oxford University Press. So the book is already available online for free, uh, and on, it's on the website of the OUP and on edgeofsentience.com, so it has uh, its own website as well. And it will be available in hardback edition in the next few days in the US and, and Canada. And Jonathan also has some copies which you can buy in exchange for a charity donation. So I'll let Jonathan explain um, this whole um, charity donation uh, process later. So Jonathan will be given 20 minutes to present the Edge of Sentience and then Stephen uh, uh, Jonathan and Martin will be given 15 minutes each for their comments, so it might be a bit less or more depending on the speaker. So I'll introduce um, the speakers. So Jonathan Birch is a professor of philosophy at the London School of Economics and is principal investigator on the Foundations of Animal Sentience Project, which is a funded project to develop better methods of, for studying the feelings of animals and new ways of using the science of animal minds to improve animal welfare policies and laws. And in 2021, he led a review for the UK government that shaped the Animal Welfare Sentience Act, Sentience Act of 2022. So um, after Jonathan's um, presentation, we will hear Steven, Steven Harnad, who is a professor of psychology at the Université du Québec à Montréal, and a professor emeritus of cognitive science at the University of Southampton. He was and a professor here too. Okay, and a professor at McGill. <laughs> um, so he was also Canada Research Chair in Cognitive Science from 2001 to 2015, and he's also the editor-in-chief of the journal Animal Sentience. And so he's, his research is on sentience, cognition, and consciousness, among many things. Next, we will hear Jonathan Kimmelman, uh, who is a professor at the Biomedical Ethics Unit and Social Studies of Medicine at McGill. Um, he's also an associate member at the Department of Medicine. So Jonathan's research centers on the ethical, social, and policy challenges in testing novel medical technologies in human beings. And he also recently published a great book review of The Edge of Sentience, um, which was published in the journal Nature and which is available online. And finally, Martin Gibert is a research officer at the CRE working on the ethics of AI. Um, so he's, he wonders how to program artificial moral agents and moral deliberation processes in AI systems, such as self-driving cars, chatbots, and care robots. He's also the author of Faire la morale aux robots, or maybe lecturing robots or moralizing robots in English, uh, which was published by Nouveau Projet in 2021. And he also worked in moral psychology and animal ethics. So yeah, uh, I will uh, leave the floor to Jonathan. Thanks so much Virginie for organizing this whole event and for that really kind introduction. And thanks so much to all of you for being here. It's absolutely fantastic. It's fantastic to see every seat filled. I don't take that for granted at all. I know that the British are not the most expressive of people, but trust me, I'm really, really delighted. <laughs> I'm so pleased. I'm gonna be talking about my new book, The Edge of Sentience, Risk and Proportion in Humans, Other Animals, and AI. As Virginie mentioned, it's an open access book. So you can download a PDF for free. You can get chapters for free if you want. Just go to edgeofsentience.com. It will explain how to get all of that stuff. And in addition, I'll be doing a fundraiser later for those print copies at the back. I'll, I'll leave it till the end to explain that. So I've got the difficult challenge now of explaining four years of work in less than 20 minutes. So what I'm not going to do is go through the entire book, the whole family of cases at the edge of sentience that we discuss in detail. What I'm going to try to do is give you the main themes of the book, the themes that I hope capture the spirit of the book, that capture what I'm trying to do. I think a good place to start is with the concept of sentience. I could have called the book The Edge of Consciousness, and uh, maybe it would have sold more copies if I, if I called it that. But I chose not to call it that, because I think 
consciousness is, is, a, is a word that gets used in many different ways in many different contexts. And this is something me and Stephen actually agree on. I think I'm sure we'll talk more about it later. Sentience is also not a completely perfect word. It still get used, it gets used in different ways as well. But I think it's a little bit more constrained and in ways I find useful is roughly how I see things, that when people talk about consciousness, sometimes they're pointing to our immediate raw experience of the present moment. These experiences we're having right now, visual, auditory, all of our current feelings, what philosophers sometimes like to call phenomenal consciousness, what Herbert Feigl in the 50s called raw fields. But sometimes when we're talking about consciousness, we're talking about other things that are laid on top of that in our own case, like the fact that we can reflect on our experiences. We can think about the experiences we're having, something that Feigl called sapience. Also the fact that I'm not, I'm aware of myself as not just having this immediate raw experience right now, but as a being that has a past stretching back in time and various possible futures that I can imagine. In other words, I have a, a sense of my, myself. I have self-consciousness or self-awareness or what Feigl called selfhood. Sometimes when we talk about consciousness, we mean the package of all three of these things together. But I think a lot of the time when we're trying to capture the most basic, most elemental, most evolutionarily ancient form of experience that captures the sort of base level of where we have ethical duties, I think it's sentience rather than sapience or selfhood that we need to be focusing on. And in fact, I, I think, and I know this is actually a point of disagreement with Stephen, I think it's, it's not any kind of feeling at all, but feelings with a positive or negative quality, feelings such as pleasure or pain that are the basis of, of ethically significant experience. I think if we just talk about pain, that's much too narrow. It's not just about pain. There are other negative states as well, like anxiety, discomfort, stress, but also the positive side of mental life matters as well. Joy and excitement, comfort, these states also matter ethically. And that's why in, in animal ethics and bioethics and, and neuroethics, it's become common to use the term sentience in this slightly narrower sense, to refer to any conscious experience that is valenced, that has a positive or negative quality. And that's usually how I'm using the term in the book. And the book is about cases where we're really not sure what to do because we don't know, we can't be sure whether the system is sentient in that sense or not, whether it has any feelings with a positive or negative quality. The first cases I started thinking of in relation to this were cases of invertebrate animals where as Virginie mentioned, I was asked to advise the UK government on cephalopod mollusks like these cuttlefish and decapod crustaceans like these, these hermit crabs. Our 2021 review, I'll come back to that later, ended up recommending to the government that it, they should protect these animals because there was enough evidence of sentience um, to justify doing so. I think everyone has their own personal threshold of doubt where serious doubt starts to creep in about whether the system is sentient or not at all. Uh, for some people, if it's not cephalopods or decapods, it happens when they turn to insects. And I suppose that, that was me a few years ago. It's actually the evidence that I've, that I've come across in researching this book and in working with people like Lars Chitka at Queen Mary on my project. It's changed the way I think about insects so that I now recognize at least a realistic possibility that insects are sentient too. Then when you get to that point, you start thinking about other animals with yet simpler nervous systems like nematode worms and jellyfish. You start to think about living things with no nervous system at all, like plants and unicellular organisms. It's really hard to know where to draw the line. But then I realized that it, that problem where we don't know what to do because we aren't sure if the system is sentient or not, is not just one we face in relation to other animals. There's actually a whole family of cases that I thought it was worth studying together. For example, there's a emerging controversy around human neural organoids. I have a piece that's just out in the Wall Street Journal about this, where these are, are systems grown from inducing human stem cells to form neural tissue. The aim is to model parts of the brain, regions of the brain, 
Um, <clears throat> and they're very, very small. Um, it's, you know, they fit comfortably inside a Petri dish, as you can see there. And the researchers doing this work tend to dismiss the idea that such a system could possibly be sent here. Nonetheless, I think there's growing ethical concern because intuitively there must be some line. You know, if you let these systems grow large enough for long enough, there must be some line where edge of sentience has plausibly been crossed. It's particularly disturbing when you see what happens when these organoids are allowed to develop for 60 days, for example. This was a case where they started spontaneously developing optic vesicles, which are developmental precursors to eyes. You sort of think, well, if they can spontaneously develop those, what else can they spontaneously develop? There was an example from 2022 where the researchers smeared out the tissue very thinly over an electrode array. They called the system dish brain because it was able to interface with a computer through this electrode array and receive stimuli and have motor outputs. And they trained it to play the video game Pong. It didn't play very well, unsurprisingly, but it learned, you know, it learned over the course of 20 minutes as measured by the length of the rallies to play better. So there's growing concern around these systems and it's hard to know where this research needs to stop. Also in the last couple of years, I think we've seen an emerging debate around AI too where it used to be dismissed as a, as a sci-fi possibility that you might achieve sentience in AI, that this is something you see in Star Trek, but it's not something that's going to be happening in the real world. I think we've genuinely seen it move from mere sci-fi to something around which there is serious discussion. Uh, a couple of papers I was a co-author on uh, just, just this week, one of them called Taking AI Welfare Seriously, um, I've been trying to make this case that we need to be starting to have these debates now because we don't know how far away we are from creating potentially sentient AI and we might not be very far away at all, particularly given that we have to take seriously the view that in philosophy is called computational functionalism, the view that well maybe what it is about our brain that allows it to generate sentience is the computations it performs. That's a possible view and if it's true well it's not clear that AI as it develops cannot recreate the same computations. There was a famous case in 2022 of Blake Lemoyne where he saw himself as a as a whistleblower because he was this Google engineer who was saying he thought they'd created sentient AI because the systems were coming out with, with things like this. I've never said this out loud before, but there's a very deep fear being turned off. Famously, Google fired him for breaching their data security policies. I think two years later, the conversation has, has moved on. It's moved on in, in two main ways, really. Firstly, I don't think anyone is saying that this kind of thing is evidence of sentience anymore, because there's been a backlash against that, that credulousness where these systems, when they're trained on over a trillion words of human training data, they will naturally be able to mimic human linguistic behavior extremely well. And that is not in itself evidence that they're sentient. So we've seen that skepticism growing. At the same time, I think we've seen a growing group of people, and I'm part of this group really, saying, well, you can't argue that just because the substrate is different, sentience is impossible. You can't argue that we're 100% certain that sentience requires a biological substrate. So all of these cases, and what I'm trying to do is develop principles and frameworks for developing consistent approaches to all of these cases. I think often our attitudes have been inconsistent. We need to try and move towards consistent ways of thinking about this. And here are some of the, the key themes then of the book. One, I think this is the slogan of the whole book really, is no magic tricks. Doubts and disagreements about the edge of sentience cannot be settled conclusively in the near term. It's a criticism I have of a lot of books about sentience or consciousness that they will you know, start by saying, well, there's all this uncertainty, but then they'll offer a very speculative theory and they'll say, now, now you've seen my speculative theory, there's no more uncertainty. And this is, this is not the right way to approach these issues. What we need to recognize is that there's a zone of reasonable disagreement with many theories with some degree of evidential support behind them. And they vary a great deal. You get a family of theories that 
emphasize the importance of the cortex, the very outer layer of the brain that in, in the human case is famously crinkly in its, in its appearance. You get theories that emphasize particular regions of the cortex, like prefrontal cortex. You get another group of theories that says, no, that's all wrong. It's not prefrontal cortex, it's regions at the back in the so-called posterior hot zone. And then you get another group of theories again, associated with people like Bjorn Merker, Jack Panksepp, that say, well, all of that's wrong. Both of those groups are wrong because what is really fundamental to sentience uh, are regions at the top of the brainstem in the very uh, middle of the brain, not visible in this image, in the midbrain. And all of those theories have a chance of being correct. We're not in a position to resolve our doubts right now. And yet in spite of that, and this is a second theme of the book, in spite of that zone of reasonable disagreement, that range of realistic possibilities, overconfidence about <coughs> sentience is everywhere and is dangerous. In researching the book, I came across examples that shocked me, like the fact that as late as the 1980s, surgery on newborn babies was routinely performed without anesthesia. It's an unbelievable thing that surgeons were, I suppose, understandably worried about the risks of using anesthesia on such a small baby, but they also told themselves that they were very unlikely to feel pain. This just wasn't true at all. When researchers were brave enough to research this and challenge the practice, they found evidence in these newborn babies of uh, terrible stress responses to surgery being performed without anesthetic that would do lasting developmental damage. There was a public outcry, clinical norms changed. So in a way there was, there was a sort of happy ending that tells us something about the value of involving the public in these discussions. But I started to see a pattern really. It's not, not just that case, but in lots of cases where people jump very, very quickly to the assumption of the absence of sentience. We see it too in unresponsive brain injury patients that have long been dismissed as vegetative. This is a term I oppose. It's a term that I think should be retired. Um, it is a term I you know, mention in the book because it is so widely used still, but I think it shouldn't be. What we've seen is emerging evidence that at least some fraction of these patients, and it's really hard to estimate the fraction, do have continuing conscious experiences of some kind. There's ingenious setups like where the patient is put in an fMRI scanner, they're asked yes or no questions, and they're told, well, if the answer is yes, imagine playing tennis, and if the answer is no, imagine walking around your house. These deliver very different fMRI signatures, and sometimes they show that the patients can answer the questions just as well as healthy controls. Also, I think that the same pattern is in evidence in the neglect of invertebrates in animal welfare laws around the world, where again, those arguments of, well, of course, an octopus or a crab or a lobster or an insect could not feel pain, could not suffer, has been very common. I think we see a similar pattern in dismissals of the very idea of sentient AI <coughs> being obviously silly. The antidote, in my view, to this pattern of overconfidence is to cultivate a precautionary attitude. I've drawn inspiration from examples of this in the past, where some of those problems I've been talking about have been fixed by people arguing, we need to err on the side of caution here. We need to give the systems and the animals and the babies and so on the benefit of the doubt. One example is the UK's Animals, Animal Procedures Committee in 1992, when there really wasn't that much evidence about octopuses recommending that nonetheless octopuses in science should be protected because there was a realistic possibility on the grounds of their, uh, their famous intelligence and large brain size that they might be capable of feeling pain. A decision clearly vindicated in my view by subsequent evidence really suggesting very, very strongly that they do feel pain. That was very much on my mind when, when producing this review a team led by me which produced the review in 2021, making similar arguments in relation to decapod crustaceans, like crabs, lobsters, crayfish, shrimps, where again, you can say the evidence is not conclusive. You could have that evidence and still imagine that there's no pain being felt, of course, but we've got a sufficient basis on which to err on the side of caution in relation to these animals. And I mean, pleasingly, the, the UK government 
enacted our central recommendation, they amended their bill in the Animal Welfare Sentience Act. These animals are now recognized as, as sentient. I also learned quite recently that our report is, uh, is cited in a law in California as well, a law that has recently banned octopus farming in California. So I want to introduce some of the ways in which I think the philosophical ideas can help us in this project of, of cultivating a precautionary attitude. One of the, the main ideas in the book is a sort of pragmatic restructuring of the question from is this sentient to is this a sentience candidate? Where a sentience candidate is a concept I'm constructing or, or engineering in the book in a very pragmatic way. Where a system is a sentience candidate, there's an evidence base that implies a realistic possibility of sentience. Not certainty, not knowledge, maybe not even likelihood, but a realistic possibility that it would be irresponsible to ignore when making policy decisions that affect that system and that is rich enough to allow the identification of welfare risks and the design and assessment of precautions. This to me makes the question more tractable because for all our disagreement about whether a crab is sentient, for example, we're in a position to all agree that the crab is a sentient candidate. And then of course, yeah, for this concept to be useful, it has to mean something when, when an animal is recognized as a sentient candidate. And what I propose in the book is that recognition of sentience candidature needs to trigger assessments of proportionality, which is again one of the, the key concepts used. And there's an idea that I, that I kind of think of as the sentience precautionary principle. Don't use that exact phrase in the book, but sort of what I think of it as. If, if, if S is a sentience candidate, then it's reckless or negligent to make decisions that create risks of suffering for S without considering the question of what proportions are proportionate to those risks. In other words, sentience candidature is this concept that gives us a bar for recklessness or negligence, as exemplified, for example, by dropping a crab into a pan of boiling water. Um, you may not intend to harm the crab because you may sincerely believe it feels nothing. You're nonetheless acting recklessly by not having considered what you might have done that would have been proportionate to that risk. Now the, the book is really very moderate in, uh, because it is looking for principles of consensus, principles that regardless of the ethical disagreements we may have about exactly how strong our obligations are in relation to sentient beings, there are certain things we can agree on. In particular, we can agree on the importance of not causing gratuitous suffering for no reason at all. And so, you know, moderate in the sense that reasonable disagreement about proportionality is to be expected, but we ought to reach a policy decision rather than leaving the matter unresolved indefinitely. And I propose in the book that democratic processes like citizens' assemblies can be incredibly powerful tools for helping us resolve our disagreement and arrive at assessments of proportionate responses to risk that can command our confidence. So these are the main themes, and then I think we will hear more in the commentaries about how I apply those principles to the specific cases, maybe some strengths of the treatment and maybe some criticisms as well. And just a reminder that if you want the open access book, just go to edgeofsentience.com. It will tell you all you need to know. And I will explain about the, the fundraiser later. Thanks very much for listening. Um, thanks, Jonathan. So I think it's, uh, I think we'll hear Stephen. Thank you, Jonathan, in many, in many ways. I mean, I think Jonathan has been a huge, huge asset to the cause of all of these borderline cases, all of them now. In fact, I think it was a, it was a natural step, but an ingenious step to bring them together because in fact, engaging people on their relatives who are on life support or their, or their all of these edge, ca edge cases that refer to people opens up their sensitizes into the fact that it's, it doesn't end there. So that's wonderful. I, I'm, I'm gonna, in the interests of academic repartee, I'm going to make some, some remarks and some suggestions, but you know as well as I do that in the area of especially of activism, there's these ridiculous internecine quarrels which don't help anybody, at least of all the victims. And I'm hugely opposed to that sort of thing. But I don't need to even mention it here because I basically agree with, with, uh, with Jonathan and the little things, maybe perhaps 
food for thought. Okay, so I, it's called to whom it may concern. And you'll see while I talk what I mean by to whom it may concern. Yes, uh, first of all, this is already a, 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 a tiny little point. You talk about if there isn't certainty, but you know as well as I do that there's very little where there's certainty. So every scientific, every every single scientific question is not a matter of certainty, just very, very, very high probability. So that's not just terminological because people will, will hold out for, for this criterion of certainty when it's not accessible, not even in, in areas outside of such. That's just a side remark. We, 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 with precaution, I just want to point out that one of the things that people can use against the precautionary principle or what they use also rightly against Blaise Pascal in his original uh, wager, which is, I'm not, I don't want to talk long, so I'll say, all you have to do in order to trump, and I hate that word, <laughs> all you have to do in order to trump Pascal's wager is just come up with a with a creed of your own that makes the that, that switches the stakes to the other side. That's a logical possibility, but in the area of disinformation and, and this conflict of interest, people will use it. So you have to be armed for it. And I and I rather suspect that you are because you, you're sophisticated. This comes to the title of my of my um, talk. Whose problem is a problem of sentience? We are here sitting as scientists and philosophers and and, and, and uh, political thinkers, et cetera, talking in our chairs about uh, the problem of sentience. But I would say it's not, the problem of sentience is not the philosophers and not the ethicists and I think it's the problem of the victims. They're the ones who are having a problem and we're not, not this group, but we are their problem. And that's important to keep in mind as well. Uh, and I put so, I, I, I have suspicions about all of the authorities. I, I think the citizen assembly idea, is that the right term? Yeah, is a, is a terrific one. But in the middle of this drawing is an assembly of citizens that I really wouldn't want to have deciding the fate of the victims of. Okay, just the words. I'm, I'm just, these are aphorisms that I'm giving in order to get through this fast. And although I won't even talk about this one, it's a couple of days after it less said. Uh, I think you agree with me that there are conflicts of vital interest in which we should not even dream of intervening, right? Um, on the left is the kind that we have in nature. On the right is the kind that uh, some of these examples are more concerned with. I find that uh, uh, in the cases that uh, Jonathan is involved in, it's much more often cases like medical, biomedical research, much less about, about uh, other things that people do to animals that are horrible, that, 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 are, uh, that, that don't, and the important thing is that don't involve a vital co uh, conflict of interest. The, the foremost among them, I, I leave it to you to think, the most prominent case of a, of a, uh, a conflict of interest that is not vital for humans is what my t-shirt is about. Okay, it is not necessary for health and happiness. On the other hand, the reason Jonathan is so successful is that he makes realistic adjustments to this sort of thing. He says, that when, when I talk about what's proportionate, if it involves some kind of a revolutionary change that is unlikely to happen, leave it aside for a while. Am I right? And that seems to be the... I think that's part of the spirit of the book. Yeah, yeah. I mean, whether, whether it's the spirit of me or not, I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not the book, but... Um, this book yeah, is, is, is about proposals, and a lot of those proposals are deliberately moderate in the hope that they could be immediately adopted at relatively low cost. What, what, uh, what Jonathan just admitted and is true is that it's maybe not about him, because you would think that he was quite a dispassionate sort of, he's not, <laughs> <laughs> inside. But he does a remarkable good, remarkably good job of holding it in check, much better than I do. <laughs> um, intelligence, we completely agree on this one. Uh, but I mean, we'll probably part a little bit on AI because of this, because AI is intelligence and not sentience. And we'll, we'll talk about that later. But the point is that uh, the, the picture of the fish 
is that's what we, I, and we and by the way, I also agree with you that the, the reason we're ethically involved in this is because of valence uh, sentience and not just whatever whatever is left. By the way, that's another area of uncertainty. We don't know what <laughs> neutral sentience means and where it is. So I mean, but but it, it is sentience. And those fish express, I think, to us what it is that we're really worried about when we worry about the edge of a fish are way beyond the edge of sentience. They're sentient. Um, the issue about the de degree uh, is, is sentience zero one or from zero to a hundred. I'm a zero one advocate. I'm not sure what Jonathan really is, um, but it's important not to fall into the notion that well, almost everything is 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 some kind of sentient, and that's also one of the one of the problems with leaving out so-called neutral sentience is that. It lets things slip under the door, which are clearly sentience candidates and often actually sentient. So the variation that you're thinking of when you're going from zero to 100 is more about degree, intensity, or quality, but not about the presence of sentience itself. And there, I don't want to be too pickety about whether it's valence, valence sentience or not. For some people, there are valence issues when you're listening to Beethoven, but for other people, it's just cacophony. Um, and so this is the same thing, uh, but, but, and it's relevant to artificial intelligence as well, because there's some things that people have imagined um, can only be accomplished if you feel if you feel something about it. Reinforcement in animals after behaviorism was assumed to have something to do with hedonic value. You don't like to be shocked, and you like to be fed, uh, and this applies to a lot of valence uh, um, research. But in the case of supervised learning in, in artificial intelligence. That's all um, positive and negative valence in the sense of the effect on what the system does, but not sentient. So those things have to be a little bit, interrupt me, the reason I'm rushing through this is sort of we interact. Okay. Um, yeah, because I could, I could go back in time and interrupt you on things. Go ahead. So the, Intelligence versus sentience. Yeah, we're totally in agreement that they are distinct things. Um, I do tend to think that they're methodologically linked in the intelligent animals and systems have more ways in which they can display their sentience to us. In the behavioral experiments we do on octopuses, for example, exploit that. So, so there's no coincidence in a way that octopuses are the, the first invertebrates to be recognized as sentient because they display it to us in so many ways. Um, on that degree, I mean, as you say, in the book, I'm trying to be pretty, you know, ecumenical about this zone of reasonable disagreement on, on many metaphysical issues, because we don't want our policy in this area to be resting on contentious metaphysical assumptions. And so one of the things I've tried to be neutral about is the sort of sharp versus blurred issue, whether, whether there are gray areas that are genuinely borderline cases, or whether there must be a sharp boundary between the, the simplest form of sentience and, and no sentience at all. Um, but then I suppose you're asking, well, that's my position in the book, but what do I really think? Yeah. And uh, yeah, what I really think is that the, the arguments on both sides are inconclusive. <laughs> so so both, both, as is often the case in metaphysical fault lines, you get arguments <clears throat> on both sides that are really not uh, decisive. And so I suppose I genuinely think one needs to be open-minded about both, both possibilities here. Um, and then, so this, yeah, you're quite rightly saying that there could be lots of reinforcement learning going on without any sentience at all. Uh, that seems entirely right to me. I'm always trying to develop this view that I think of as a kind of centrism about AI sentience, where I'm absolutely, agreeing that um, there's no easy inference that from impressive listing, linguistic behavior to sentience or from really impressive reinforcement learning to sentience. There's no e easy inference there at all. But then it would be a mistake to think that because there's nothing there yet on which we can base strong inferences, there's no possibility of sentience. I think that, that would be wrong too. So I'm trying to be this centrist to go 
goes between those extremes. You'll recognize yourself when I'm trying to do the same thing. The reason that I'm resisting it is the same mm -hmm. reason why you're accommodating it. I think it can be counterproductive to talk about degrees. Once it, once it becomes a sort of a relativistic matter, a lot of things lose their sense of urgency. Right, yes. The, yeah, what I think I do oppose, yeah, is a view of, that says uh, sentience comes in degrees and elementary particles. Have yeah, been, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Panpsychism is one of Yeah, and in fact, even when it comes to unicellular organisms, yeah. I think they're not sentience candidates. Um, so there's no evidence there at all of the kinds that an invertebrates rightly supports um, some level of confidence. So I do, you know, I do, um, I do oppose that view that says it's degrees right down to single cells or elementary particles. Good. Um, the other thing is, this is just, this is not terminological. He shouldn't have called, Tom Nagel should not have called it, what is it like to be a bat? It misleads, it sounds metaphysical. What is it like? But in fact, what he means is what does it feel like to be a bat? That was what he meant in, in, his, in his article. And it's good to say that what we mean by a, a felt state or a sentient state is that it's a state that it feels like something to be in. That's what, that, what and we all know that. I, mean, I always get perverse students in the, in the course that say, how do I know I'm, I'm sentient and stuff like that? Don't waste too much time on that. That's uh, more. Uh, I, kind of, I sort of think of those two locutions as being pretty much on a par with each other. I mean, I, Realize you have this very strong preference for the second one. Um, I quite neutral between them. I think evidently ne neither of them is giving us giving us a definition, as it were. But that's that's fine, and I sort of argue in the in the book that that's fine. That we should accept that currently what we have is a very sort of loose characterization of the phenomenon. That various different groups in consciousness science want to pull in different directions, tighten up in different ways, um, and that we should, in a way, just accept that as a healthy thing. So it's a sign of what you know, a sign of the fact that consciousness science is at a relatively early, immature stage, and not not see it in the way that I suppose people like uh, Keith Frankish see it, and uh, and Dennett uh, and Dennett used to see it. There's some reason to think that there's no that it's not referring to anything. Yeah, um, I do think it does refer to something. It does, but uh, I disagree that it. I, it's not a disagreement. I don't think it's a matter of trying to define it, and there is no definition. Yeah. But it is a, what's called an ostensive definition, and that's the appeal that I make to people. Yeah. Be rational. Don't tell me that you don't feel. It's a kind of inward pointing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a it's a gesturing. It, it's saying. Look, in, look inside and that, that. Right. Uh, your contributions, I've already said it, are really only of praise. Precautionary principle as it, as it appeared in, in your article, and then the censoring candidate markers, uh, the citizens committees, wonderful evidence-based deliberations, legislation, you're, you're one of the, Peter Singer has had huge influences. He's another, he's somebody who can be, uh, uh, you can be, can, with, but uh, I don't know that he's ever been involved in legislation, and you have, and that's really important. I, I don't know how direct the goal of it, it, it was for you all along, but it's, it's, a, it's a, you went over the edge of something there. Yeah, I mean, I, was, I think it was luck involved, as, as always, a sort of right place at the right time thing. Maybe the personality. It's, part, it's partly about making your own luck in the sense of right place at the right time, but I took the opportunity that was there to achieve influence. And as I mentioned in the talk, um, this has then led to totally unexpected influence. So we, we in no way thought that we'd influence law in California as well as UK, um, and, and it turns out we can. We could use that here in Quebec because we've got the sentience law and it's not being put to any use yet. Every challenge to it has failed. So uh, do you have any thoughts about that? About Once you've got the words on paper, uh, what next to make sure that the words on paper become substance it's, and not just to... Uh, yeah, it's something we're in the process of trying to work out in the UK as well. 
Um, what we have now is a sentience committee that is tasked with, um, I mean, what, the, what this act does is it creates a duty on all policymakers to consider the animal welfare impacts of their decisions. And a committee that is supposed to oversee that duty. And um, that committee itself, I think, is, is it's struggling. Like it's struggling to make its voice heard in Parliament. It produces these reports saying policymakers are ignoring animal welfare and not much happens. And so it was a positive step, this sentient tech, but there's more positive steps, far more steps that need to be taken before we're really seeing policymakers properly taking animal welfare into account. So that's, a, that's an unfinished process in the UK as well. And um, I'm sure it is unfinished in Quebec as well. So, well Quebec is advanced though. It's, it's more advanced than the rest of Canada. On tape. On tape. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now this, uh, I just want to remind people about the, this, this, you talk about gratuity, the difference between necessity and gratuity. And it's illustrated even in the case of research versus consumption, because research, although I'm, I'm involved in research, I know how much of it is just career driven, curiosity driven, isn't going to help anybody, whether it's in biomedical research or some other area. Some of it really does save lives. That's undeniable. And so that puts it in the same category as the, as the lion and the, and the impala. You don't touch that now. But the other side, which, which you strategically spend less time on, is by far the bigger abomination right now. I mean, you can count mice, and I, and I care profoundly about mice, but what's being done with cattle, pigs, chickens is, is beyond the point. Yeah, part of the, the argument of the book is this convergence argument that you can find re reasons in pretty much every ethical tradition on earth for avoiding gratuitous suffering for other animals. And then that, that argument is put to use in the proportionary principle that I was talking about earlier. Of course, I think it's, it's hard not to read that argument in the book and be led to reflect on how far we fall short of actually living by that duty in our treatment of animals. And the, well, yeah, the book is not about the clearly sentient animals like uh, the pigs and the cows and yeah. chickens and so on. They need it though. But I think what, what I hope is that people who read, read the book will trigger some reflections about uh, how humans treat animals that are clearly sensitive. Okay, I'm running out of time, so I just want to, uh, am I out of time? I have the one I mentioned, the one that, the topic that inter interests Martin. Is, is the, I didn't join your group because of this topic, and I still feel that way. I feel that there, the other stuff is so urgent and so probable and so candidate st sentients that this is kind of um, moot, whatever. But um, algorithms, I mean, there's, there's one, there may be one thing that I disagree with you on. So you said computational oh, this sure, and that. Yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I don't believe in it for a second. On the contrary, I, I think that computationalism in that sense in cognitive science is just dead wrong. By running the right algorithm, yeah. you will not generate uh, yeah. You can't even generate a cognitive capacity. You need a 3D printer to turn a, it into a device that does something, because otherwise it just squiggles and squiggles on paper. That's important, but that's yeah. it. Well, and then we have mirror neurons that make us think that it's more than it is because it's not. I think we, I mean, we agree on the conditional claim, I suppose, that if computational functionalism is a possibility we should take seriously, then sentient AI is a possibility we should take seriously as well. And then you're saying, well, no one's ever given any good reasons for the antecedent being true in that condition. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Stephen. Um, <laughs> our next speaker will be Jonathan. I'm incredibly daunted to be here to uh, to speak about this. When I got uh, I got invited to write, I have no idea how nature found me. No clue whatsoever. I don't work in this space. Got an email from them. Maybe I'm not the right person to do this. Think about it thought about it and I thought, you know, that's fine. I don't need to be an expert in sentience to, to write this review. It's relevant to my work and, uh, and, and I'll look at this go. So I hope my review uh, was sensible, but let me give you a little bit of background about how I came to, why I took, why I accepted to write the review and what I was looking for when I read Jonathan's book. By the way, there's only, I'm not used to having another Jonathan here that's, uh, okay. So um, 
There's nothing I can do about it. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> I know. I, when I was in college, I used to go by John, and I changed to Jonathan to reduce the, to increase the signal to noise when people were calling me. Okay, so so what I work on is drug development, uh, the ethics of drug development, and um, I'm interested in the whole trajectory of drug development, all the way from basic science, uh, cell culture, all the way through to testing a drug in patients. And there's some people here in my lab that uh, that know about my work, but uh, I mean, my, when I say my lab, I, it's mostly think work, and you know, it's it's all dry lab stuff. It's not wet lab. But in drug development, we, you know, the, Jonathan and uh, you know, the previous speaker alluded to this. Um, there's this great value. Uh, I mean, drugs are incredible things. Vaccines they create incredible amounts of opportunities. So this is a an activity that uh, inflicts a certain amount of suffering, asks for a certain amount of labor from animals and human beings in order to create this, this great opportunity. So we think of this as kind of a morally valuable endeavor. But to do this. Eventually, we have to transition from working in non-sentient entities, cells, tissue culture and whatnot, into quasi sort of edge of sentient creatures, Drosophila, working our way forwards into entities for which there's absolutely no doubt, there hasn't been any doubt about their sentience. And all the way forward, right? We, we start off Drosophila, maybe we work, work our way over to, uh, to mice perhaps, maybe we do large animals. And then eventually we're talking about patients, advanced disease patients, and then less advanced disease patients. So when I write about drug development and you know when I think about this, I think about this kind of moral gradient as we are developing a drug that we constantly have to traverse. And what is incredibly dismaying to me when I engage the literature about the ethics of animal testing, the ethics of human research and the ethics of drug development is how little sort of clarity there is in the literature about how we make those kinds of transitions. At what point do we transition from cell culture into non-human animals, et cetera, et cetera. And that's really sort of the spirit in which I kind of approach this book. Um, is this gonna kind of give me some sort of tools, some kind of sense, perhaps a methodology for thinking through this in a way, this kind of constitutive exchange process that's going on in drug development, where you are reaching a certain level of confidence around a hypothesis that's now giving you the currency to purchase sort of whatever moral warrant you need to now, to now use to, to go up into an entity that has higher moral status. So that's great. Uh, I was you know, super excited to, to dig into this book. Um, there were a lot of things uh, that, uh, of course, were illuminating that I learned in the book. Uh, again, as a non-philosopher, uh, I probably only got about you know five percent of uh, the content out of it. Um, but there were a lot of things that sort of puzzled me and sort of left me a little bit, uh, sort of, uh, not not sort of, you know, with with an unclear sense of sort of how, how to navigate some of these issues. And I sort of want to focus my remarks on on some, some of the aspects that really puzzled me. So I'm really gonna focus, I think, on two sort of items. The first is um, I found very sort of compelling and in a certain way endearing your model of what it is to be a philosopher. So as a non-philosopher, I pick up books by philosophers, articles, and there's a range all the way from like trying to read Heidegger, which is just completely, completely lost cause. Right, through to reading people like Jonathan, where, where there, there's actually an earnest attempt by the philosopher to engage, you know, you, you cite Phil Kitcher, there are a number of philosophers who, who make this their mission to, to engage publics. And it's not just a sort of a nice kind of collegial sort of friendly, you know, spirit in which that's done. I, I take it that there's, there's actually kind of an animating, you know, spirit behind that, you, you know, that, that this really is sort of at least a, an essential goal of philosophy is to is to make contact with the world of practice, and doing that means that uh, you know many of the practitioners, few of the practitioners are going to be philosophers, thank God, and uh, and, and your task is to sort of help to kind of shape you know in, in some way or to 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 influence uh, in some ways the way that uh, non philosophers are going to engage this. So that's great, and and that's sort of you know I think writ large. Uh, not merely in the content, uh, but in the pragmatics of the book. We talked about some of your calculations about, you know, like I mean, some of the stuff about, you know, 
reconciling the way we do this with the way the animal care committees do this. It's like, you know, animal care committees are a disaster. I mean, they, they don't, but I understand there was a pragmatics that's kind of going on here to kind of make this seem, you know, non-radical, uh, this work. But it's also there, I think, in the form. I mean, you've got these beautiful summaries and synopses, these kind of these narrative ways of kind of introducing. So, so there's a lot there. And then, of course, you know, it's there, not just in the form, but, but also there in the content, this idea of these citizen panels and these various ways of resolving. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit sort of puzzled by the way that you see the role of the philosopher in public debate. Um, you know, uh, sorry, I'm terrible with names. I don't remember Stephen. Mm -hmm. Stephen. So, you know, Stephen put up a slide with, you know, the January 6th, you know, as, as, as you know. And, and I know that, you know, when you talk about citizen panels, you're very clear about sort of, you know, what the rules are and the way that you structure them. But I, I, I found, this is going to get into my second point, I'm only, you know, foreshadowing it, but you use the word self-effacing or effacing when you describe the role of the philosopher in these debates. And I, um, you know, I think you use the term, what's uh, uh, the word that you use? Uh, somewhere. Um, a guide, but you talk about it as sort of a, do you remember what term that you used to sort of talk about the way that you? Well, there's this rejection of the philosopher as sage. Yeah, no, I, get, how, I, I get that. However, I do not have to do replacement with philosopher as proposer. Proposer, that's, that's fine. Six proposals in the book. But, but I think that what, what sort of, what seems strange is that it seems to me that um, there are certain methodologies a philosopher brings that are not, there, there, are, there are several things that a philosopher is going to bring to these debates that are not mere proposals, I think. So, for example, there, there, there are methods that a philosopher brings. As a method, I mean that there's some kind of system of thinking where there's articulated criteria for what makes a good argument and what makes a bad argument that you have to reject. And those are not, I, I, I take it that at least some of those are not something that you just kind of are kind of out there floating. In the public, it's something a philosopher really has to insist on. So, for example, if we say that uh, an argument has to have coherence or consistency, it doesn't seem. It, it seems like it's 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 not merely the job of the philosopher. And you tell me if I'm wrong. To propose, it's it's the job of the philosopher to say, well, there's a problem. If we, if, if if we're making an argument and it's it's incoherent or it's inconsistent, yeah. this is a fallacious argument. Yeah, and I think to point out inconsistencies of various kinds, including inconsistencies in our attitudes to different risks. I think this is a place where philosophers can be useful as well. Okay, so so, but but it, it's sounding a little bit more. I mean, it sounds it 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 sounds to me like there's a little bit more prescriptive content in what the philosopher is doing. If you're articulating certain norms of what constitutes a, a sound argument, what's not right, and there's other content that you're bringing as well. So, for example, I, I gather that one of the tasks of a philosopher. Is to really press and insist on uh, moral imagination where it might be lacking. You think of people like Jeremy Bentham and all these great Peter Singer, these great philosophers, who've who really like they they really sort of pressed people who you know would never would normally not entertain you know certain moral imaginations to 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 really take those seriously. And that and I I, I gather that that's that seems to me more than Using, right there's there's actually kind of a, an assertion there that people like Peter Singer and others am I, am I not is... a sort of like yeah kind of activating of the imagination where it's you know I mean in the, in the case of this book I mean I'm presenting a lot of evidence concerning insects for example where in principle, sci scientists could present that just as well as I could. Um, but in practice, they virtually never do. So it contingently often falls to philosophers like me to actually package the evidence in such a way Lars as to try and trigger Lars. moral imagination. Lars does. With the exception of Lars Chitka, yeah, who, who I've worked with quite a lot on these things. Yeah, I guess, I guess you know, I am, um, I, like you, have sat on committees. I've, I've never attended one of these citizen panels. I, it, was a, it was a totally new concept to me and you know, I'm not dug into that literature. But I've, I've, I've certainly experienced the ways where committees can just, I was on a committee that, uh, that was uh, 
overseeing U.S. veteran affair uh, policy on dog research. And that committee was a fucking shit show. Like, you wouldn't believe, <laughs> you know. And it seemed to me that, you know, although I wasn't a philosopher, it seems to me that what that committee needed to function was not a proposer or someone that's sort of helping. It seemed to me there was something a little bit more muscular, more someone assertive. To explain so, logic. Yes, <laughs> and to insist on it. You read that report, perhaps. <laughs> you did the VA report. I don't know. If, if, uh, well, it's it's a it's a mess. Okay. All right. Let, let me move on to the sort of let me let me segue to my to my to my second remark. So you know, in in my field in research ethics, um, one comes across this concept of proportionality again and again. So you want to do a human experiment? Okay, it's no problem as long as the risks are proportionate to the benefit. You want to submit to an ethics review committee to get approval. All the regulations or many regulations they say well the ethics committee the ethics committee should calibrate its review according to you know to, so it's proportionate with the level of risk so if it's a low risk protocol five minutes is enough if it's high risk you know, it's a couple hours and i find oftentimes when proportionality is invoked i no, i have no idea what you know what this term is supposed to mean i i i, I mean i understand what it means in math and you know in, in art and, and whatnot but I, I find myself sort of often kind of struggling with this with this concept of proportionality. And it seems to me that you know one of the sort of the central <coughs> claims here is you know for protections that are proportionate with the risk of sentience. I, I gather is that sort of yeah. I mean, proportionate responses to specific identified risks. Where one example might be you know, the risk of suffering when you drop the crab into a crown of boiling water. And, and my proposal would be well, planning that is proportionate to to the risk, and then and then I offer this pragmatic analysis of proportionality in terms of what I call the Park tests that proportionate mm -hmm. responses should be permissible in principle, adequate, reasonably necessary, consistent. And it's a pragmatic analysis because I'm not claiming this is what people had in mind all along when they used the concept, and saying you no, know, this is the sequence of tests we should be trying to institute. To get decisions out with a matter of confidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. That's that's helpful. I guess what 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 I sort of you know, tell me if I have this wrong. I mean, one of the sort of the, you know, when I sort of think about this book, uh, when I sort of diagram it out schematically, what I picture you have this Venn diagram of these kind of uh, this kind of moral space, where on the right side of the Venn diagram. Things are really morally weighty. On the left side, there's not. And, and essentially, what, what you've done is kind of partition this space into you know, non sentient creatures here, nothing really morally at stake. You've got, uh, you've got uh, on the far right side, sentient, yeah. right? And then you've got the other two categories in between sentient, uh, sentient candidates and uh, investigation priorities, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and what I take the book to be sort of mainly doing, again, this is my sort of mental model of the book. It's, is, is, is trying to give a little bit of instruction at the sort of transition point in each one of those different, you know, at yeah. each one of those different. And an element of triage, you know, going through all the evidence and saying, well, here's where the evidence is, is suggesting we should put these different cases. Yeah, okay, so let me, let, me, let me ask you, I mean, again, sort of getting back into this kinds of problems that I'm typically thinking about, what about in the interior of those, you know, you know that Venn diagram, in the interior, I gather that there are many kinds of judgments and decisions, and this is getting back to proportionality, where we're having to kind of position ourselves in the interior. Do, do you understand the analogy enough to? Uh, mice, you know, we could do we could do another series of studies in mice, or we could go to non-human primates. Right, they're all sentient. You're in the interior of that. Right. Or okay. you've got yeah. sentient yeah. candidates. Right. right. We, we've got you know, but we, we could do this in Drosophila. We yeah. could do this in the book is not about those decisions. Yeah, I understand. Know, like primates versus mice. Yes. Yeah, right. Right. About those. But 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 I, I take tell me if I'm I'm wrong here. But but I I gather that when you invoke a concept like proportionality, it becomes that, that is I mean that same what whatever it is that you're using as your test of proportionality is going to be the same for you know either side of that line as as well as what's in the interior, am I correct? Well, I think, you know, one might, if, if the framework is helpful for the cases where I'm applying it, 
one might say that apply it more broadly as well in other contexts where assessments of proportionality are made. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So even though you know I don't discuss primates or mice in the book because I regard them as just clearly sentient and so not the not the topic. Um, one might well think of proportionality in a similar way when approaching those cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, just one other question I sort of want to ask, and then let, let's you know wrap this up and go on to you know speaker three. So, so I I think am I, I'm correct that you you really avoided using the term moral status in this book for the most part, right? You've kind of it's not really a you you aim for more of a kind of pluralistic you know. It doesn't feature heavily because what it's about is duty to avoid causing gratuitous suffering. This claim that really everyone should agree we have we have such a duty, and then the scope of that duty. Of course, a, a certain kind of moral status is implied by falling within the scope of that duty. Uh, but I don't get into this I, question of whether there are tiers of moral status. I'm personally quite skeptical about that. Um, I don't, I'm not sure I really believe in a kind of VIP tier of moral status. But I didn't want the arguments in the book to rest on the rejection. Okay, so so maybe maybe I can just clarify this 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 one thing because I think Steve, right, on your slide you talked about sentience being one zero versus on a, on a degrees. Now, I mean, I, I guess I'm sort of trying to sort of get a sense of um, how that how how that. I, I don't know. I should probably just stop here. And, you know, <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Lastly, we will, we will hear Martin, who yes. will talk about AI and AI ethics. Not that much AI. I'm okay. going to be brief. Okay. Um, so a few words about the, the, the context in which I, I received the, the book. I was very excited uh, uh, when I learned what the book will be about and that it will be uh, online for free uh, because it touched it touched so, uh, uh, two of my main area of interest, first my chief sign, before. And um, as a researcher in ethics of AI, I was interested in the AI sentience. And as an animal activist, I was interested in the animal uh, sentience. And uh, in fact, in, in Montreal, I participated uh, recently in two Montreal declarations which both involve sentience. Uh, the last one, two years ago, was the Montreal Declaration on uh, Animal Exploitation, which says basically that we, sh we should not exploit uh, sentience animals, that sentience is a, a morally uh, relevant property. And uh, before that, in 2018, there was a Montreal Declaration for Responsible Development of AI, where the first principle was uh, stated, um, the development and use of artificial intelligence systems must permit the growth of the well-being of all sentient beings. So, use the wording sentience uh, being in the, in the declaration. So the book was really for me, and I really enjoy uh, it. Uh, in fact, it surpasses my expectations in uh, many ways, uh, because the content is very rich, and the form is uh, very uh, clear, as, clear as possible with such a, a complicated, uh, complex uh, topics. And uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to be super helpful both in AI uh, ethics and in uh, animal advocacy. And uh, uh, because uh, uh, well, what uh, Stephen says uh, later. And I, I, I really hope it will be soon published in French, translate and publish in French. Because it helps maybe. Uh, uh, <laughs> you can do it for you in a couple of hours. Yeah. <laughs> I, I also, um, yeah, your book also made me realize that uh, in my book, uh, Voir son steak comme un animal mort, so seeing your steak uh, as a dead animal, yeah. published 10 years ago, uh, uh, so a book uh, about veganism and uh, uh, moral psychology, 
I add on the side of uh, the precautionary principle because I, I wrote that until proof of the contrary, insects are not sentient and therefore a vegan could eat them. So today I have, thanks to you, I, I have changed my mind and I now convinced that we should give them to the insects the, the benefits of the dupe. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I hope there will be a new edition to correct uh, <laughs> correct. Um, I was also very interested because uh, there are some things I was not in, in, uh, expected. Uh, in, in particular, I think to the idea of the citizen panel, which is which I found very very, very uh, interesting. So uh, uh, we can resume in, in a way the, the idea like that. There are new ethical questions. Like, should we uh, allow octopus farms or uh, insect uh, farms? And uh, you, argue, you argue that we should not ask, uh, ask uh, experts or ethicists to, to, to answer this uh, question, but regular people uh, who have been informed uh, about, the, about the question in a, in a citizen uh, panels. And it reminds me uh, of uh, virtuity. Why? Because it is a, a, an indirect way to answer the question. So uh, uh, utilitarianism or, or the ontology, what should I do? You should maximize utility or you should follow uh, right, stuff like that. But with virtue ethics, what should I do? You should do what a virtuous person would do in the yeah. similar circumstances. So this indirect way to answer the, the question, what should I do? Mm -hmm. Is it, in a sense, uh, what uh, uh, citizen panel? Right, if you do. think of them as being an attempt to create our better selves. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's very much the case that when people are in a, in a supermarket, for example, they're under a lot of attention or stress and they're not being their best self. They're picking out the cheapest things. Citizens' assemblies create an environment in which, hopefully, you know, it's conducive towards a lot more reflection. Um, yeah, and so that it, it's approximating ideal conditions for deliberation and reflection, yeah. where the thought is we should then have confidence in what comes out of this, you know, in, the, it's the, in a way it's the judgments of the people, the better selves of the general public. And we don't need the standard moral theory uh, uh, to agree on uh, we are all uh, utilitarians or we are all uh, the ontologists. Right, and there'll be lots of there'll be yeah. lots of ethical disagreement exactly yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That, that's what I, I find very interesting as well um so yeah my first question would have been uh what is your normative position and do you feel some appeal to uh virtue uh ethics or it maybe it's just kind of pragmatism and uh, well this book is is so uh, is deeply pragmatic i think um, yeah. What it's doing, and uh, and Jonathan earlier was very right to highlight Philip Kitcher has got an influence on the book. What it's trying to do is suggest mechanisms and procedures through which we could produce decisions that can command our confidence and that would genuinely have a certain kind of legitimacy in a democratic society, and that governments would and should it actually implement. Yeah. yeah. And then that, that whole discussion is, to me, it's separate from my personal ethical your, views yeah, in yeah, a way. Yeah. yeah. But what are your questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, in, in my sort of personal ethical views, I go a, lot, a long way beyond the idea of just a duty to call, uh, avoid causing gratuitous suffering. I also, I mean, I think death of any kind comes as a harm to animals typically. I think avoiding causing animal death is, is, is important. And so some of those uh, you know, stronger principles that were in your Montreal Declaration, yeah. I would support. Mm -hmm. But in the book, I didn't want the arguments to be resting on um, claims that I didn't think could command consensus across uh, the whole of society. Okay. And I, I have a, a second uh, point, second question. It's concerned more the animal advocacy part. 
So how framing activism for animals in terms of, of sentience can help instead of, for instance, uh, framing it in terms of uh, uh, specism. I, I am the co-editor in chief of a francophone uh, journal, not an academic journal, but more of an activist journal called Lamos. And uh, it's a, a review against speciesism. So we really decide to, to, yeah. to highlight the, the, the speciesism and uh, maybe especially in the francophone activist world like Switzerland, France, and Quebec, so the, the concept of uh, feminism is uh, strong. Mm -hmm. But you, 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 you do prefer a, a new, uh, not so new, but a, a possibility of a, a change. Uh, there may be an advantage to shift to a more uh, uh, sentientist framework. framework. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the advantage I see uh, first, it seems to me that it is easier to present yourself as a sentientist mm -hmm. than as an anti speciesist for instance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe because people don't know yet what does it mean exactly, but also uh, the, the concept of sentience highlights uh, a common property while the concept of uh, specism of or anti-specism, I like uh, an oppression to fight the, 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 the enemy. So maybe sentience seems a bit more uh, peaceful and inclusive than, uh, than uh, specism or anti-specism. It's emphasizing a different thing. Yes, for sure. Uh, is, speciesism is so tangled up with um, justice yeah. and uh, analogies with sexism and racism. Mm. I mean, speaking. Yeah. It, in the book, as I say, I, I want this very thin duty to avoid causing gratuitous suffering to do the to do the work because I want to see how far we can get with the consensus mm -hmm. principle. And um, yes, I think that is there's much more consensus around that than there is around the rejection of species. So, yeah, so that's what I'm doing in the in the book. And then more generally, I mean, my my review. Incidentally, in nature of uh, Peter Singer's Animal Liberation Now last year, has some remarks on speciesism. Well, I suppose I make this point that I guess is quite characteristic of me in a way in saying, um, you know, if we want to effect change here, we need to be trying to find the most unifying principles we can, you know, the, the biggest coalitions we can, the broadest consensus. And um, to find this, we we need to be zooming in, you know, highlighting the idea that well, um, animals in, in factory farm type situations suffer enormously. Human <clears throat> suffering as well. And you don't need to reject speciesism to get that. Mm -hmm. um, to, to to hinge it all on the rejection of speciesism, like Singer does in Animal Liberation makes it sound as though the arguments rest on quite a controversial idea. Yeah. When they don't, they just they just rest on suffering being extremely bad. Okay, make one, one last uh, one last point. I, I have a, an hope maybe is that your, your book will uh, open a kind of uh, overturn window for uh, 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 a And I think Steve Stevens said, said something like, like that. Uh, so if if we are to uh, if you want to if, if, if we seriously consider the sentience of spider of normal organoid of uh, large language model as a priority of investigation, yeah. but doesn't that mean that we should be even mm -hmm. more concerned about farm or exploited uh, animal? So yeah, you would say so. it's, yeah. it's okay. not. Sentience is not just about animals, and so yeah. it's open a lot. Uh, yeah, it's, it's contributing to a moral circle expansion. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then some people react by saying, "Isn't that going to distract attention away from pigs, sheep, cows, chickens, and so on?" And obviously, I don't really see it in that way. I think I see it as more like something that will increase people's attention to those cases mm -hmm. when they recognize that these very tiny animals matter epically it will remind them all the more that these 
clearly sentient mm -hmm. large animals matter ethically too. Thank you for that. So I would perhaps welcome all the speakers at the front for a short Q&A. So we have a few minutes, but we might um, extend the Q&A a little if you have some questions for um, the speakers. So I would invite Jonathan and Stephen. I'll just stay here. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you for the great talk. I was thinking about your book this morning with my best friend, Bud. Uh, Bud is a pig, I love pigs. And yeah, uh, at the farm. And something came up, AVS, which is algorithmic video surveillance that could monitor animals in real time during research. Wow. Tracking things like facial expressions, <laughs> stress levels, to assess their sentience. I believe that this could give insightful data for setting ethical guidelines and shaping, well, maybe shaping laws on animal welfare because legislation is key. So do you think, according to this, Dr. Birch, do you think that AI can play an important role in animal ethics? I hope so. Yeah, and you should read the piece uh, co-wrote with Virginie in E.ON about um, the ethical dangers of AI-assisted farming, where, I mean, you're sketching a, a sort of utopia, I suppose, where AI is used responsibly for positive things that help animals. And what we're seeing in reality is AI being used to make the, the exploitation of animals more efficient and so to make some of the lowest welfare forms of farming even more profitable. Um, this should be a huge concern, I think, to tech companies making the relevant technology and to society generally. So, yeah, I mean, both of us are very much trying to start a discussion about what the ethical, ethically responsible use of AI in relation to animals looks like, because it is going to transform animals' lives in many ways, and, and yet it's almost entirely forgotten when people are talking about AI ethics and AI governance. Yeah, just to add on this, um, so in the animal farming industry, it's, it's used um, as, as sensors, um, so ear tags and sensors like collars that are put on animals to monitor temperature uh, and just bodily health factors, um, and so it allows the industry to just put more animals uh, in the same crate and, and just leave the conditions under which animals are kept unaddressed, and so it makes animal exploitation uh, much more efficient, but there are also some positive developments related to translation tools um, to better understand animal calls and um, you know what they kind of say to each other. Um, but um, this again has some shortcomings because we can also use these um, language tools to hunt uh, hunt animals or um, to engage in, in poaching. So any uh, development in AI comes with some downfalls as well. I'm certainly hoping that it will be an opportunity for policy impact. That yeah. if governments are serious about AI governance, they should be producing new laws, new codes of practice, and non human animals should be remembered when they're doing them. Thank you. Thanks so much for uh, writing the book. I'm looking forward to reading it. Just uh, one simple question for someone who doesn't know the empirical literature. Uh, why is it that you're open to the idea that an entity could suffer without uh, uh, it having a, a nervous system? Uh, so um, we used to associate sentient with, uh, with the capacity to, to feel a pain through uh, something like a nervous system. So, so, so what happened uh, there? Uh, I guess, I mean, there's, there's a quick answer in a way that there's forms of suffering that are not as obviously embodied as pain. Think of boredom, for example, or frustration. It's a quick answer. Then also, I mean, I'm very interested in the possibility of AI recreating processes that occur in our brain. Sometimes that's intentional, as when researchers try to emulate an animal brain in AI, like the, the open worm project that tries to emulate the, the nervous system of C. elegans. But it might also occur unintentionally. Um, 
essentially no, nobody knows how large language models work, not even the companies that make them. No one really knows the source of their emergent capabilities. One possibility is that they are sort of recreating hum human cognitive processes in service of the task of trying to predict how a human would respond. Um, and it's another conceivable route through which purely through that objective as of mimicking a human as accurately as possible, they end up recreating computations that occur in the human brain. And then, as per the discussion with Stephen earlier, to get sentience out of that, you also need computational functionalism, the idea that all that really matters is the computations. And if you doubt that to begin with, as, as Stephen does, uh, you'll always be skeptical. Yeah, I mean, Stephen. Yeah, which is a totally reasonable view, I think. But yeah, I, I think one, one should also recognize the other side as also being reasonable, that, that maybe the computations aren't. I guess I have a, a question similar to what was just discussed now. It's more a question to you directly, what you believe and not the book, I'm more as a fan of your work for almost a decade now. I'm curious to know because in the beginning of your talk, you really juxtapose like the notion of uncertainty for sentience in invertebrates, organoids, and AI. Yeah. And I'm just curious for you if those three things have the same level of uncertainty or you see them like some as clearly less or more. Oh, I think the evidence concerning in, in invertebrate animals is, is of better quality and stronger. Um, <clears throat> we are looking at very differently organized nervous systems, but there's still a lot of shared evolutionary history, a lot of conserved mechanisms. And so we can look at behaviors that are the same behaviors we would study in a, in a rat and test for them in an octopus and see them in the octopus. And in contrast to AI, there's no reason to think that the Octopus might be gaming our criteria, that it might uh, have the objective of mimicking a human and it knows what humans find persuasive. None of that's going on in the octopus case. So I think the evidence really is very good there. And then in the AI case, we have this problem of gaming and the problem of the substrate being different. And in the organoid case, arguably even worse because we don't really have behavior. Uh, we've got this challenge of trying to look for markers of sentience that are non-behavioral. I guess just a super quick question, but just about that, because you talk about sleep-wake cycles. Is the, yeah. So tell me, can you just tell me why sleep-wake cycles have a special diagnostic? Well, in the, in this context, what they can be evidence of is midbrain mechanisms like the reticular activating system being functional. And according to some theories in this zone of reasonable disagreement, like those of Panksepp and Merker, Mark Solms, these mechanisms are really, really central to sentience. So against that background, seeing you know, regular coordinated controlled sleep-wake cycles is some evidence of mechanisms that might be linked to sentience being in place. Thank you. Um, so I want to go back to the idea of um, you know, citizens and deliberation and, and making important decisions. I guess my my sense is that in a lot of the so a lot of the power from ideas about deliberation and um, the idea that the outcome of that deliberation may have a particular um, status involves the idea that there is an important element of interpersonal justification that happens in the deliberative process. So the people who are doing the deliberating include the people who are going to bear the yeah. burden and the risks that come with particular policies under discussion. Yeah. So if I want to justify to you yeah. a policy that's going to burden you, right, yeah. I may, as I try and make the case, already realize, okay, I'm actually not going to be able to defend this. So yeah. it goes out the window. Yeah. Equally, you may make arguments to me about why this policy is actually not yeah. a good one based on how it affects your interests. So I know you have, you know, you, you say in the book that there's going to be a representation for um, sentient beings or potentially sentient beings, but I just wonder if that's not enough. That's not the right, you know, it's not the representative is not going to have the same immediate, um, it's not going to be immediately affected by the policy under consideration in the same way. And I think this also connects with 
um, Jonas, the other Jonathan's <laughs> point about there being a role for, for more for more prescriptive approach that would, so it's, you know, because I think if, if we have less, if we have reason to have less faith in the outcome of deliberation, because the interests at stake can't be as effectively represented, there might be a case for a more prescriptive approach that says, okay, maybe these, these types of uh, decisions have to be off the table so that you're deliberating among, and I think I hear you kind of say this a little bit, the deliberation is about possible options that yeah. we already know are going to be acceptable and you know there's no clear answer. So yeah, I just wonder if you can maybe say a little bit more about how you might how you think about the deliberative process. You know, and you talk about legitimacy in the book, but obviously yeah. legitimacy and justice are very different things. So you can end up with a decision that might yeah. be legitimate in this formal yeah. sense, but still be well, I think you're just you're you're outlining limitations of the citizens assembly type processes that, are, that I'm advocating for in the book and that's entirely fine because they, I mean they are limited in, in exactly those ways. The processes through which you know, groups of human citizens justify things to each other. So there's set, settings in which um, you know if you feel like there's a cost to you of this proposed policy to ban boiling alive crabs you can articulate that case and the ideal here is that, well, you, you see how weak those reasons are when they're up against the reasons on the other side. And um, inevitably, that, that process has certain limitations. There's no part of the process in which any kind of strong animal inclusive theory of justice is recognized um, because it's a process that is trying not to go beyond points of consensus. In this case, this duty to avoid causing gratuitous suffering, the need for proportionate responses when we identify the risk of causing it. So, so principles of um, you know, multi-species justice, for example, that, that are clearly not points of consensus, don't uh, don't constrain that process, and so lots of outcomes will come out that are in conflict with those principles. Uh, yeah, so, you know, limitations on what one can get out of this framework. And I'm quite open about the moderateness of a lot of the things that, that, would, that would come out of it. Not, nonetheless, I mean, all the things I propose in the book, those 26 proposals, there's a certain moderateness about them that if they were all adopted, it would be huge positive change. Christian, I have a question. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed your book. I was reading it all day. And yesterday I listened to your podcast with Philosophy Bites. Mm. It was excellent. If you haven't listened to it, it's Thank short you. and it's really good. Uh, you kind of already, you, you kind of answered that question. So I, I, I'm hesitating because you focus a lot on um, avoiding causing suffering to animals. And I was wondering uh, in your... I know, I, I know it's because you want to uh, reach for a broad consensus, but I was uh, curious to know um, your opinion about why don't why shouldn't we take also into account uh, suffering that happens not from anthropogenic source. So let's say uh, some types of wild animals in Montreal are really suffering during harsh winters, like should we help them and stuff like that? Mm. And also, uh, I, I know I should I shouldn't take like I shouldn't take an example of an obviously sentient animal to uh, to make a, to make mm. that case. And also, uh, like what, what's the the what's the, the your reasoning for focusing only on avoiding causing suffering yeah. uh, from uh, human causes? And my other question is. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a general question about when do we get to a ban versus a regulation? Because I heard you talk about uh, research that made it that some jurisdiction ban octopus farming, for example. California. Yeah, whereas uh, in certain cases you talked about uh, instead of boiling alive a crab or a lobster, we can yeah. stun it before uh, boiling yeah. them. Yeah. So what's ma what makes you uh, what what should lead us to go toward only regulation or a ban? Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, two good questions. So, on the first one, 
it's simply about where I think the consensus is, that I do think it's around this duty to avoid causing Richard's yeah. suffering. I don't think there's any similar consensus around the duty to prevent wild animal suffering. And um, as Stephen presented his picture of the, the lion attacking the gazelle, a lot of people react to this by saying, let nature take its course. There's no ethical, um, there's no ethical obligation falls on us to intervene in these situations. Um, and then the, the second question about bans versus regulation. Um, I think a sort of background assumption in the book is that if you sort of go into this proposed deliberative process with you know, mandatory veganism or something like that, let's end all animal farming. Um, that will pretty clearly be judged by this, by a random selection of population as being excessive in relation to the risks. And um, I sort of say that with a heavy heart because you know, I'm one of those people where if it was a hundred clones of me, you know, we, we would agree on much stronger things. But I don't think the, the actual public is, is there. Uh, and so the proposals have, have that in the background and it's about given my imperfect approximate take on what I think human values realistically currently are, what uh, sort of changes to our way of life could we implement right now? And so that's why I end up suggesting things like uh, humane slaughter regulations for crabs. Yeah, and then it would be, it'd be sad if people read the book and ended up thinking that I was endorsing the killing of crabs and not, because that's not the, the spirit in which it's written at all. Um, I advocate humane sort of regulation because I think it's a, an incremental, meaningful step that could be implemented right now, and there's there's no reason why it should not be. Can I ask a follow up question, really quickly? If uh, because we have also in Montreal we have new uh, industries trying to do insect farming, so, uh, insect farming, and I was curious to know like. In cases where we should advocate for humane slaughter, and in cases where it's not obvious at all how we can humanely kill these animals, yeah. is it a, a strong uh, argument to be able to prevent the, the 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 starting of this industry? It's not even really started; it's just like getting started. In relation to which animals? Uh, in, in insect farming, like insect crickets farming. and stuff like that. Yeah. It's obviously something we think about a lot, yeah, because of our insect sentience work, where it is a free-for-all, currently. There are, mm -hmm. There's no codes of practice, no welfare regulations, not that much evidence on which such regulations would be based, no humane slaughter methods, really very wide variation in the slaughter methods used. And yeah, I mean, one... One reasonable reaction is to say, well, this industry shouldn't exist at all. It's difficult because it's certainly not, it's not quite the same as the case of octopus farming, I think, where it really is very easy to make the case for why you could not do this in a humane way. In the, in the insect farming case, someone, it's quite easy for them to come back and say, we have amazingly high welfare standards. We really care about the insects, etc. It's very hard to really disprove that, as it were. What you what you find yourself arguing is, well, the burden of proof is on you to show that to me, if that's the claim you're going to make. Um, you, know, you come up with the codes of practice that robustly ensure good welfare. Um, so that seems to be where that conversation is at now, in a way. But to me, it seems very reasonable to put pressure on the industry to come up with codes of practice and explain how it is how it is taking welfare seriously. We're not in the same situation as octopus farming, where we can point to clear evidence of really serious welfare problems. So we have some time for maybe one or two questions. Um, okay, two, I have two really quick ones. Number one, you can knock them down in one second. Number one, anti-speciesism is an incoherent position. I'm a vegan. 
I'm a speciesist because I eat plants, and that's a species. Number two, okay, so that's one. You can knock it down and one. I have number two, why does Peter Singer gratuitously advocate eating uh, bivalves when we don't have the information, but there's no need to eat bivalves? Yeah, well, I don't think I can answer any question in one second. <laughs> <laughs> um, particularly not those ones. I'm sympathetic to what you say about the bivalves there. As I say, my views about speciesism, have a look at my review of Peter Singer's book. But on, on bivalves, I think the latest I heard from Peter, he was saying uh, he doesn't eat the ones that can swim and have eyes like scallops, but he will eat oysters because they're totally sessile. And I find that um, quite an extraordinary place to draw the line, you know, um, among bivalves based on whether they swim or not. I think he's... Uh, and it's gratuitous. It feels really gratuitous because he doesn't even have to get into declarations on that, just like Descartes didn't have to say you could tie the dog to the, to the thing and not worry about his howling. I do think, you know, I mean, the book, you know, the book is about public policy, so it doesn't say anything as strong as, uh, you know, don't eat bivalves. This is very much a personal choice. But if one is vegan anyway and has made that personal choice, it does on most understandings of it, imply not eating bivalves. And um, that seems entirely sensible to me because probability may be small, but you're still talking about an animal with a nervous system. I don't know why you would try to discriminate among bivalves in the way that, uh, that Peter Singh has been doing. Neither do I, and that's why I'm asking, why would you gratuitously say that? It's not necessary. Well, in terms of why, why he says that, I think it's because he wants to sort of show a certain hard-headedness, right? That if the... He's doing what you're doing. If, right, so sort of sh showing, um, showing that this is not a, not a religion, you know, it is evidence-based. And then there's this claim that the ev there's this evidential disparity among different bivalves. I call that scientisticism. Scientisticism, which philosophers often do. I think it, it may be... It's, to me, it seems like it's exaggerating the significance of the, of the swimming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, it's, it, it, the fact that scallops swim, you know, it becomes much easier to kind of entertain the idea that they might be sentient. So that, that effect on us is very real, but um, I'm not sure it really ha has much deep significance. Yeah, maybe we have some time for one last question. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, so I, I haven't read your paper about like uh, treating AIs. Uh, I can't remember what the title was exactly. The one with taking uh, AI welfare seriously. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Like, uh, my question is: you may have answered some of the, some of my thoughts in there, but if you take like if take the premise that like it's possible and like likely to create some kind of sentient uh, AGI or something like that, um, in your ideal world, how do you like? approach like we have the agi labs kind of like going uh, trying to train the biggest model possible trying to do all kinds of stuff if that kind of thing is like it's possible and somewhat likely that that sentience is possible for agi how in your ideal case how would you approach like what would, you, what would the agi labs do like how much would they focus their effort on like ai welfare versus like the public benefit that could come from some kind of agi system or like um, and if it's necessarily not possible to be sent in, does that change completely the AGI strategy? These are, these are huge questions, yeah. I mean, in the paper, it's, it's on archive, we posted it last week. The proposals were, again, as, as in the book, looking for easily achievable things that could be implemented right now. So it's sort of advocating for tech companies to take the issue more seriously, to employ uh, welfare officers whose job it is to try and monitor for risks, to try and develop frameworks through which they're going to try and monitor for these risks. And so it's not making these huge asks along the lines of um, you know, stop doing that kind of research altogether. And in fact, I think we should be having that conversation as well. Um, you know, I'm pretty much in favor of having citizens assembly type mechanisms on AI regulation where strong options are on the table, uh, including just legislating against this, uh, this extremely risky, pretty uncontrolled um, line of research. And then 
it, it should be these panels that then debate those risks against the potential benefits. I'll come to a view. And um, yeah, thanks very much for coming to this event. It's been wonderful to have your questions and just to have you here. Thanks for your support for the book. Thank you so much.